what is spirituality? We're going to uh, have a bit of a look at what modern definition describes it as. Um, and then we're going to turn to the Bible because that's really the focus of this seminar is what the Bible talks about spirituality. And what we are probably um, going to find is that there's a bit of difference between the modern definition and uh, what the Bible has to say. So hopefully um, there'll be three main parts. The first one is what is the modern definition of spirituality and where that came from? Uh, then uh, the origin of true spirituality, where that came from and its connection with the Bible. And then finally, what that actually means for us. So let's have a bit of a look at what spirituality is. This is actually from the work of uh, Elizabeth Scott. Uh, she's done uh, quite a bit of work in, in this field. Uh, you can actually go to uh, verywellmind.com and actually follow some of her research. She's done a PhD in this. And uh, so it's a, a bit of a summary from uh, the, the modern understanding of what spirituality is. So basically, the modern definition is that spirituality is the broad concept of a belief in something beyond the self. It strives to answer questions about the meaning of life, how people are connected to each other, truths about the universe and other mysteries of human experience or existence. Spirituality offers a worldview that suggests there is more to life than just what people experience on a sensory and physical level. Instead, it suggests that there is something greater that connects all beings to each other and to the universe itself. Spirituality is not a single path or belief system. There are many ways to experience spirituality and the benefits of spiritual experience. How you define spirituality will vary. And one of this, uh, one of the key points of this modern definition is it separates between what um, psychologists and uh, philosophers and psychiatrists in particular think spirituality means in comparison to religion, and that religion is actually quite separate to spirituality. So spirituality can be practiced individually, whereas religion often is practiced in community. Spirituality doesn't have to adhere to a specific set of rules, whereas usually religion is based on a specific set of rules and customs. Spirituality often focuses on a personal journey of discovery um, that is meaningful in life. Uh, often in religion, it focuses on the belief in deities or God's religious texts and tradition. So that's what the modern definition does. It separates between what it positively sees as spirituality of self compared to the traditional order of religion. Now, I've been an educator for, well, until I retired a few years ago uh, for over 35 years. And uh, one of my roles as a school leader was actually introducing the wellbeing framework for students. Uh, about 15 years ago, it was introduced in South Australia. And then uh, a lot of those philosophies and things were also integrated in the Australian curriculum. Um, and what's really interesting is that there have been some studies done recently on the impact of those things. So while education systems in Australia have acknowledged the importance of spirituality for student well-being, according to an ACRA national survey conducted in 2018, the majority of Australian teenagers have little to do with organised religion in their personal lives while a significant proportion are interested in different ways of being spiritual. Um, the Australian Generation Z study uh, found that the majority of teens in Australia do not identify with religion, while little more than a third believe in God. So the conclusion from the studies, which have been done after around about 15 years of integrating spirituality into education schools suggested that Australian, Australian teenagers are more likely to be spiritual, according to the modern definition, than religious. So where did this, this modern idea of spirituality spring from? Well, the words that became translatable in the various languages around the world as our English spirituality uh, began appearing in the fifth century. And they were common in the Middle Ages and were used for living according to the spirit of God. So that's what spirituality meant originally when it first came into the English language. In the 11th century, the word began to denote the mental aspect of life, 
as opposed to the material and sensual aspects of life. By the 13th century, spirituality acquired this uh, a, a two-pronged understanding, a social and a psychological meaning. The social meaning was really the dominion of the church, the domain of the church and the priesthood, um, whereas the psychological aspect of it was used in the analysis of emotions, motives, and inner dispositions. So you've got this split between what was traditional clergy, if you like, and this way of examining our emotions and thinking. Then in the 17th and 18th century, the word took on a, a negative connotation often. Uh, it often was actually associated with spiritualists, communing with the dead and that sort of thing, and it often had a negative connotation. And that continued throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, um, where the notions of spirituality really developed by mixing Christian ideals with Western traditions and elements of Asian, especially Indian religions. Uh, a lot of that sprang through um, art, music, and became embedded popularly, um, often through folk and pop music as well, and became basically socially acceptable uh, as looking at other um, ways of thinking through other countries and their cultures. So spirituality became increasingly disconnected from the traditional religious organisations, um, and it was okay to be spiritual, though not religious. So today, uh, basically, this comes from the work of Houtman Ospers in 2007. Their research said that it basically associated uh, was associated with philosophical, social or political movements such as liberalism, feminist theology and green politics, and has become a humanistic ideal to reach the true self by self-disclosure, free expression and meditation. In other words, spirituality in the modern age has come to mean the worship of self. So what was originally when the word came into the English language was used for worshipping according to a spirit of God has now in the modern age become how we look after self and worship self, connecting with this greater uh, spiritual world that's outside that we don't really know or understand what it is, but we feel it uh, and, and we can connect with it in some way through uh, meditation, through music, through various other means. Well, the actual facts of the matter is that the very concept of spirituality comes from a big biblical word. It actually springs from the Bible. So if we actually want to find out what spirituality is, we need to go right back to its original roots. So the Bible is really the original source of spirituality because the word spirituality comes from our base English word spirit. Uh, here's a little bit of an English lesson. I used to be an English teacher. So spirit comes from the Latin word spiritus, which means breath. So when you breathe out, you are actually spiriting. Okay, this is the concept. It came via the old uh, French word esprit into the English. And it takes this idea originally from the Greek word pneuma, which means breath. Um, and that word was used in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament and the original Greek of the New Testament. And this Greek word of pneuma actually came from the original Hebrew word ruach, which meant breath or wind, as used in the Old Testament. So the very word spirituality is a Bible word, springing from the original Hebrew ruach, meaning breath, breath of God. So to come to a correct understanding of spirituality, we actually need to look at what the Bible says about spirit. That makes sense, doesn't it? So to the Lord, to the testimony, this is what Isaiah the prophet says. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. We have to come back to the Bible because that's the basis of understanding Bible concepts. And spirituality is a Bible concept. Now, the Bible claims to be the inspired word of God and the only source of divine enlightenment. 
This is where our whole journey of spirituality begins with this concept. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Yes, there's our Greek word, which sprang from Ruach, Theo, God, Blestos, Numa. You can see the new, new start of Numa. This is breathed out by God. So if we're talking about spirituality, we are talking about what God breathed out. What did he breathe out? Paul tells us all scripture. All scripture is what's recorded for us in the Bible. It's the modern translation of those Greek and Hebrew documents that Paul had at his disposal. And so when we want to find out about spirituality, we actually need to turn to the Bible because that is the source of God's breath. And that's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, this is not the place for me to convince you about the Bible. All I can tell you is that I'm an educated man over many years of training in all sorts of different fields, and I've read the Bible. I didn't always, I wasn't always convinced that the Bible was right, but I am now 100% convinced that the Bible is true and correct document through the study of things like prophecy, history, archaeology, linguistic consistency, scientific accuracy. All of those things have convinced me that the Bible is true. And there are many others who think like that. So Paul, when writing, writing again to the Galatians, said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. In other words, if you want to know about spirituality, there is no point going anywhere other than what was originally taught by Jesus Christ and the apostles in these scriptures. If anyone else, even an angel, he says, were to come to you with a different teaching, don't believe them. So if you want to find out about the truth of things, you look in the Bible. Well, what does the Bible say then about where this breath of God, this spirituality, this way of thinking like God springs from? Well, of course, it comes from God himself. God embedded this search for spiritual things within each and every individual. We are actually born with the desire to find out about the things outside of our own physical and mental experience. God says through the great writer of the Ecclesiastes, he was called the preacher, uh, and he said, Solomon, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So what God did was he put within each individual person who's ever been born the desire to look into the things outside of themselves, the realm of the spiritual the things that they couldn't see right in front of them. The trouble is, is that God has done things that people can't understand. So what people often do is they turn to other fields to try to work out what God has placed. But what we've found is that the only place we can find it out from is God because it's his own breath that he's breathed out. So any efforts to go outside of the field of the Bible is actually not going to help us. It's going to lead us in all sorts of interesting pursuits and, you know, some of us like botany and some of us like history. And it's all fascinating, but it's actually not going to help us come to grips with what it means to understand the spirit of God. We have to come back to the Bible. So right from the very beginning, God created man with the ability to develop his character, to think like him, to reason like him. According to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God made humans in his image. 
the Hebrew word selen, and likeness, the Hebrew word demuth. And so these two aspects are incorporated into what we are. Selen is used of the shape of something. For those of you who know your Bible, it's the word image that was used of Nebuchadnezzar's image that looked like a man. It refers to the shape, the bodily shape that we are made in the likeness of. So we are actually made in the bodily shape of God. Now, demurth is being like someone in character. For example, it's used in Isaiah 40, verse 18, of being like God. So here's the aspect of people having this capacity to develop God's character, to think like him, to act like him. So when Paul quotes this verse, this is for those of you who like digging a bit deeper into biblical thinking, he says that a man is made in God's image and not likeness, but glory, image and glory. Because Bible students know that God explains that his glory is his character in Exodus chapter 33. So what we're being told is God made us in his physical shape. God has not a nose, eyes, ears, arms, feet, etc. We look like him. But he also gave us this unique ability to think like him. Now, the trouble is, is that Man in the beginning made a big, big muck of things. He was given a law to keep in, in the Garden of Eden, and he broke that law. And as a result, sin came into the world. And ever after that time, people didn't have a natural bent towards God and God's thinking, God's character. They had a natural bent away from God towards sin. And so people became opposed to God's way of thinking. Genesis 6, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Job says, for affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who could understand it? And the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So what the Bible teaches us is that God originally gave us the ability to think like him. But tragically, man sinned, and ever after, there's been a different way of thinking in his mind. And so these two clash. God's thinking, man's thinking. They inevitably clash. The prophet Isaiah, for example, says, Seek the Lord while he might be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God challenges people. He challenges to say, well, naturally now, instead of thinking like God, I think like an animal. How to survive, how to reproduce, how to get food. But what God wants us to do is to lift our thinking to be more like Him. So, as we develop God's character and way of thinking, it challenges our responses, it challenges the way we react to things. So, Paul says, in the letter to the Romans, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So there's now, in people who are trying to develop spirituality, 
of understanding the breath of God, we've now got this battle going on. Natural thinking says, do whatever you like, look after yourself. And the other way of thinking says, actually, what does God want? How does he want you to live? We're now getting a grip on what spirituality is actually meaning. It's actually meaning how do we find out what God's breath is and what he intends us to understand? How do we work out what the mind of God is? So there's these two minds, if you like, these two ways of thinking. We might call one the natural mind, one the spiritual mind. So in the natural mind, all animals have this way of acting. There are what we call natural propensities, which are the instincts, the drives for survival that are in every single living being, humans, homo sapiens, dogs, cats, horses, all animal life has these. But they also have an intellect which enables you to do the things to survive. So, Propensity says, I'm hungry. In the mind of my cat, it says, I'll steal the dog's food and eat it. That's the animal mind. It'd be a bit like me going up to someone and taking their hamburger mid-bite to grab it simply because I'm hungry, and that's more important. There's a natural affinity between the propensities and the intellect. Now, within people, as we've seen, God's given us a moral capacity, the ability to think like God. But in most people, it is too small to impact between the propensities and the intellect. So my lust for food isn't being mediated by a thought which says, oh, I shouldn't steal that food because it doesn't belong to me. Instead, it's just, there's the food, I need it, I'll go and take it. All right? So that's the natural thinking. It's called by Paul in Ephesians, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. It's called by John, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It is what Paul calls carnal thinking, the carnal mind in Romans chapter 8. This is a law that is in our members. It's the natural thought processes, the reasonings of the mind, controlled by the urge to survive. Now, what God is asking of us in developing spirituality is to, in fact, broaden this moral capacity so that it's actually being developed and acquired, so that there's these thought processes that are now being controlled by a morality that determines how we survive. So instead of now going and stealing Peter's lunch because I'm hungry, now I have a moral thinking, the breath of God, a spirituality, which says, oh, hang on, actually, that's not right. I shouldn't take that because that's Peter's. It belongs to him. He needs it. So I won't take it. So rather than the law of sin, which is in my members controlling us, what happens is a spiritual conscience is developed, a conscience that says, no, that's not right, or yes, that is right. And it's based on God's breath, his thinking and his mind. So when Jesus spoke to a Jew called Nicodemus, he was a a leading member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, one of the top three men of the Sanhedrin. And he said to this man, Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you can see he's picked up this idea, natural man versus God's thinking. And he's saying, if you are following after natural thinking, you cannot see God's kingdom, the great reward of eternal life that's been promised. 
the only way that you can have a hope of eternity, of something more than this life than what we have, is by being born of water and the Spirit. And then not long after that, he talks to another woman, this time not a Jew, a Samaritan woman. And he goes up to a place called Shechem, which was north of Jerusalem, where he spoke to Nicodemus. And he comes up here to a different group of people. And the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They didn't like them at all. They'd actually uh, come back into the land from all sorts of other countries, brought in by the Assyrian Empire uh, hundreds of years before. And they grew up with a very mixed and strange religion that the Jews did not like. So the Jews would not interact with the Samaritans at all. But Jesus was prepared to talk to this woman. And he says to her, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. That sounds quite familiar to what he'd said to a Jew, Nicodemus. And now he's saying it to a Samaritan woman, a non-Jew. It's the same message. If we want to come to understand what spirituality is, we need to understand God in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So here we've got a new dimension. We've got something where we can be changed from what we are now to be more like God, not just in thinking, but in something more. This is very interesting, isn't it? So now we've got this concept of spirituality that God has given the ability for, man, for us to actually think like him. We have a natural mind which says, oh, well, who cares about God anyway? Just do whatever it is that you need to do to look after yourself. And we're developing a mind, a conscience, which says, actually, no, I need to be more like God. And God now promises that people who think more like him are going to receive something particular, something special to enable them to worship him in spirit and in truth. So what did Jesus institute or what was instituted that had to do with water? Well, anyone who knows anything about the Bible knows that when Jesus came to the earth the first time, the first one of the first things he did was he went to see his cousin John, John the Baptist, who was baptizing in the Jordan River. Baptism is where a person goes down under the water and comes back up again as a symbol of dying to the old natural way of thinking and rising to a new way of thinking, thinking like God. So when we're talking about being born again of water, what was actually being taught was that we needed to be baptised like Jesus was. But there was also going to be a birth of spirit. What spirit? God's breath. So this is a development of the understanding of God's word and the growth in God's word in our life that's going to lead to a great change. So let's just have a look at what the Bible says about this. It talks about us being born again. Well, you know how things are born. They don't just suddenly turn up at the shopping centre, do you, and you don't just pick them up. So there's a conception where, where a child is conceived in the womb of its mother. And just like that, there is a conception of water of baptism. So Peter talks about how we have been born again. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it, to Nicodemus. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. And so people who came to understand this word, which was preached, God's breath, which was preached to them, they would show that they understood it by being baptized. 
that would go under the water, that would show that we deserve to die because we're naturally natural people who think about survival and not about God. But that's going to die and we're going to come out a new person who thinks more like God, who tries to serve God. And this is like a seed that's planted and this seed begins to grow. Naturally, grass that grows dies, but the word of God doesn't. This is an imperishable seed that grows into something that's going to last eventually forever. And so there's going to be a conception of water through baptism, and there's a conception of spirit through the growth in understanding God's word. So Jesus says, it is the spirit that giveth life. The flesh profiteth nothing. That's exactly the same words that Peter later uses, isn't it? In the context, he's talking about baptism. But Jesus is talking about after baptism, we're also having a new way of thinking, being born in our mind, being conceived in our mind. And the words that I've spoken to you are spirit and are life. It's God's words, his breath that have been breathed out. And that is giving new life in our thinking. So we're baptized, become a new creature. We're thinking like God, and this word is creating this new way of thinking. Well, then, of course, within the mother's womb, the, the child gradually develops, doesn't it, and grows. It's nurtured. And so in baptism, Paul says that God, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with, with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. So we've been developing through this process of being baptised, where we're no longer dead because we didn't stay under the water. We've actually come out of the water and we are now alive in Christ. We have been born in baptism, as it were. And so in the spirit, it's the same thing. If we live by the spirit, by the spirit, let us also walk. We're now developing in that understanding. And finally, there's the birth. And in baptism, we are born into, into a new situation. We change our relationship with God. Thanks be to God, Paul says in Romans 6, which, by the way, is a chapter all about baptism, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, having set, been set free from sin, you, you have become slaves of righteousness. So we're no longer now bound by that natural way of thinking which says, how do I survive? How do I look after myself? Instead, we now have this new way of thinking whereby how do we serve God? What would God want me to do? How do I be a slave of righteousness? We've been set free from sin and that old way of thinking. And so with the spirit, there's going to be a change of body, not just a change of position a status, but a change of physical body. In the future, there's a great hope that we're going to talk about very briefly to finish off to this afternoon, which speaks about the change of this body through the resurrection of the dead. It's sown, it dies a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. And the growth and understanding of God's word, that spirit, is going to result in a complete change of body. So John says, beloved, we are the children of God, God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. So we're his children. It's the Greek word technon he actually uses, a, a, a literal descendant, a, a child that's born of a, of a mother. We don't know what we will be. So there's something more we're looking forward to, another change that's yet to come. But with God's children now, because we've been baptised and we are understanding him through his word, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to heaven from the Mount of Olives, he was seen going by the disciples, the angels that were there at that time said that Jesus will come back in like manner as you've seen him go. So Jesus will return back to the earth. And what's going to happen at that point is that we're finally going to meet Jesus and there's going to be a change of body that will be like him. 
no longer dying, a spiritual body. So Paul says in Romans 8, for the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the revealing of the sons of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only so, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for our adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Our body is going to be literally changed. No longer a dying mortal body, but a glorious body like Jesus Christ, never to die again. And the word that Paul uses is not the word technon, the child of a mother, but a son or daughter of God in the character of a father. And so it's the hope of the resurrection that is this great salvation of the Jews. You remember Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, salvation is of the Jews. Why? Because of something very special that had been promised to them. And Paul later on says, well, the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings. That is the Jew's spiritual blessing. Now, what was that? Well, Jesus teaches what it was. Jesus talks to the Jews of his day and says, that's the resurrection of the dead. You have a hope of even when you die, of being changed to a different body because you've been baptised, you've changed your thinking, You've taken on the spirit of God, the breath of God, and ultimately you will be changed to have a body that suits that spiritual thinking, a body that no longer dies. And so he says to the Jews in his days, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection and from the dead cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and our sons of God being the sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. So Jesus says, all right, you Jews, you Jews were given very special promises. They were promises to your fathers, and the Jews' fathers were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the promises was a land that they would receive forever. But all the Jews knew that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. They were dead and buried. And so Jesus teaches them, well, surely that shows you that for God to keep his promise, which he always does, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must be resurrected from the dead. And that is the hope of Israel. And Paul, in his work, went around the world teaching that salvation of the Jews. He called it the hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead. You can find it right through our Acts if you have a look. And so baptism that we've talked about, this being born of water, is in fact this typical death and resurrection that we will literally go through to change physically. The baptism through water changes us morally. But there will come a time when we will be physically changed. And so Jesus says, whoever believes, believes what? Well, we know what we've got to believe. We've got to believe God's word. All scripture is breathed of God and is profitable for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So if we believe what God has breathed out and we are baptised, then we will be saved. And so Paul in Romans 6 says, well, do not you know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So Paul says that's the promises made to the fathers of the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. 
For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In other words, you will live forever to receive the promises given to Abraham. What an incredible thing that is. People try to find out about this spiritual world and they imagine all sorts of things. Some people think of angels, some people think of demons, people have devils, all sorts of things in this spiritual world. Some people just see it as this uh, this, uh, unnamed force in the universe uh, that, that, that just is guiding things. It might be called fate. But the Bible tells us what spirituality is. True spirituality is the development of godly thinking through reading the word of God. Once that word is understood and believed, we act on it in faith by being baptized, born of water, and then live according to its teachings in obedience to God's breath, his word. This is worshiping God in spirit, and in truth. At the return of Jesus back to the earth, those accounted faithful will share in the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the resurrection from the dead. The faithful will then be changed from this mortal body into a spiritual body like the angels born of spirit. So you can do all sorts of investigations of modern spirituality, if you like. There's lots of interesting philosophies and reasonings and arguments. But if you actually want to know what spirituality is, turn back to the Bible. Start reading it. It can be a tricky book to read sometimes, especially if you haven't read it before. Talk to someone who has read it a fair bit. Talk to people about it. Share your ideas and find out from them what you think. And come to develop are thinking like God's. Because the more you think like God, the more you'll be like God. And people who are like God, God has said, I want you in my kingdom. And so he that believes and is baptized shall be saved.